Well, Pastor Jason is ready, and together we're just going to address something that's really important to our life center family as we dive into the message today. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't trying to give you the squeeze no, there. No, you're good. You're good. I'm glad you're ready. I know it's a lot to get up here and yes. get your mic and your all your things. Well, let's, that's appropriately define a lot. <laughs> um, all right. But I do want to take a moment and just simply say where we want to take a moment um, and say authority has a sphere. It has a defined boundary. You know, my life, I have authority, uh, our family, our marriage, uh, and then within Life Center. And I want to let you know that today is a family talk, uh, which happens to go out on Facebook, uh, our website, and then, of course, YouTube, which is interesting because... If you're a part of Life Center, then you're within the sphere of that authority. But if you're not a part of Life Center, I want to let you know that you're listening in on a family chat today. And William James Jennings once said this, we who follow Jesus are walking in wounds, we are working with wounds, and we are working through wounds. And the last number of months, in particular online, but not just there, and most recently this past week, On social media, there are incredible people who are expressing wounding, pain, even racism experienced at Life Center. And so personally, on behalf of Life Center, for Lori and I, where we have failed, where we have wounded, where we have fallen short in understanding the depth of racial pain, we ask for both individual and collective forgiveness. You know, the Bible teaches accountability. It teaches that my sin, our sin, and then our collective sin is the underlying issue beneath all issues in society. Our sin adds to the brokenness we see in the world today. And when this occurs, we are complicit. And so where we, our staff, and Life Center have failed, have sinned, whether intentionally or not, where we have added to the world's brokenness, we wholeheartedly confess, we repent, and we ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We repent not only for the wrong done, but for the right that we failed to do. Together, Life Center acknowledges racism in all of its forms. It is not the picture of heaven we see in Revelation 7 but it is real for biopic people in Canada. And so as a lead pastor, on behalf of our entire staff and our church, we are committed to continue to listen, to to repent, to grow, to seek to understand, to be the brothers and sisters that we are in Christ. We are taking steps to to discuss, to diagnose, and develop even a better course of action moving forward as a church. We are also grateful that the Bible doesn't only teach that we are complicit in brokenness. It also teaches that through Christ alone, hope and change and transformation are really possible. We can be one, as he says and prays we are to be. And so together, we are humbling ourselves. We are seeking to understand, and we are prayerfully being used by God as ministers of reconciliation. And this work It must include admitting when we fall short. And it also must mean that we stick together to work through our offenses, our pain, to seek forgiveness, reconciliation, and equally justice and restitution. It is only Jesus who can help us work through the current issues that we are grappling with as the body of Christ, but also in society today. We want to submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus to rid our lives of the sin that causes and creates chaos because we want to see the full restoration and be, the work, be workers for God's kingdom together. Mm-hmm. Thank you for allowing us to share that together. Let's just take a moment and pray. Would you join us as we just pray together? Father, we thank you that you are more than able to do what in our humanness and in our weakness is impossible. And we know that our words are meaningless unless you transform our hearts. And so we humbly ask, both first as lead pastors of Life Center, as our pastoral staff as Life Center, as our pastor's council, 
as the members and the attenders of Life Center. Would you transform our heart so that we can be, as your word says, one, as you and the Father are one. We thank you, God, for your grace, and we know we need it continually and we will continue to need it daily. Father, help us to walk in grace with one another as we learn and we grow. And Father, we ask and we pray, as your word says, that you you said to us, God, if we would humble ourselves, if we would seek your face, Lord, if we would pray that you would in turn heal our land, God, that's what we're asking. God, heal our hearts, heal our churches, heal our city, and heal our land. We thank you, God, that it is only in you that healing is found. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. As I said a moment ago, this is a family talk today. So whether you're here or whether you're online, this is a family talk. And Life Center is one church that is represented here in Orleans, online, home campuses. Uh, we are also in Canada, and we are in Cornwall. And so what that means is that you're a part of a church that has to seek the Lord way in advance before we write a message for a Sunday. We have to be done six, seven weeks in advance to get it out to all of the teachers for everything that we need to do. And the reason why I say that is this. Today, and each day, each Sunday, that I've had the honor and privilege of being the pastor of this church, there is a boundary that I placed, that I learned from my parents, and that I placed in my heart, and it is this is that the pulpit is never a place to address people or personal issues. That is an abuse of power. The pulpit is a place to talk to the family of God about the things that we see in Scripture. And why I say that is this. The message that I'm about to deliver was written six, seven weeks ago, and I wrestled all week because of its content. But I do believe with my heart that you need to trust that I am speaking to the whole of the family for where God is leading us in the next three to four weeks. I am not addressing anyone or any individual personally. I'm speaking to the heart of where we as a family need to continue to walk together. And so let's dive in. Matthew Ball says this. Saul, I said it last Sunday. Saul was afraid to raise his hand against Goliath, but he was not afraid to raise his hand against David. We are in a bad condition when we won't fight the enemy, but we will fight our brothers and our sisters. You know, church can often be defined like these two chairs. Sometimes church looks like what we're doing right now in terms of we are sitting in a row, we are listening. It can be a Bible school class, uh, it could be a youth night, it could be a kid's church, or it could be adults. We're sitting in rows but how many of you know that this is a very important part of church, but this doesn't sum up what church also is? It's not the sum total of church. Church must also be places and environments where we don't sit in a row and listen, but where we sit face to face and we talk with one another, where we can sit and listen and encourage and admonish that we can sit and listen to somebody's experience and understand the way that they're experiencing the gospel, what it's looking like in their life, and having the respectful way to engage this together. And here's what's true of every single church, whether it's a life group, whether it's a home campus, whether it's a Bible school class, we believe it's not one or the other, but this is where spiritual transformation takes place when chairs turn from this way to facing one another. But here is what is also true in church. There are no perfect people and there are no perfect churches, and that is never an excuse for anything. Here's what is allowed in church. It is allowed sometimes to sit face to face, but to get a little bit of distance in between each other so that we don't destroy one another. Distance is not always division. Sometimes distance is wisdom. It is listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And even in relationships, and it can be in a family, it can be in a marriage, it can be between friends, 
It can be in a church environment, in a life group. Sometimes it's also healthy to sit face to face and to place boundaries between one another's so that perhaps one who is wounded has the sufficient time to heal because if there are no boundaries, then there can be no healing in proximity. Sometimes there needs to be space. And we as followers of Christ need to understand when this is happening. But we also need to discern, church, when this happens. We need to discern when the enemy has us back to back. This is the only posture that Jesus said is not only incorrect, it is sinful. And why? Because now I can no longer see you. Now I can no longer see the world as you see it. Now I am no longer listening to what you see. So all I am doing is screaming, do you see? And all you are doing is screaming, do you see? But we are not seeing one another. Jesus calls this a house divided. Not indifference or disagreement that is not necessarily a house divided. A house can be apart. If I turn that around, imagine it. But still engaged together. Over the next four weeks, we want to talk about this. You can never, ever turn someone else's chair. It's not your job. It's not your place. When any leader tries to do it, pastor, whatever, it can often only be attributed to spiritual abuse and manipulation. You cannot turn someone else's chair. But you know what we're called to do in Christ? You're responsible to turn your chair. And you may say, well, what if I turn my chair and they won't turn their back? All I see is their back. If all you see is their back, then get their back. Humble yourself. You may not be able to talk to them, but you can pray to God. At least you're trying to look in the same direction to understand that one day down the road, there may be an opportunity for reconciliation. There may be time and a season for us to... You are positioned for what God may do in a season ahead. You do not control another person's Stance, you don't control how they move, you only control your posture. And so, as life center, we want our posture to be Lord, if we can't be face to face, then at least would you posture us, God, to be humble? Can we be present for when there can be a miracle down the road? As followers of Jesus, this is just an illustration, but it is the heart of his teaching. Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16, which you're going to repeat again in a number of weeks in another message that's coming. It says, you are the salt of the earth. And I want you to hone in on two words. You are, very important. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall that be saltiness? How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are, those two words again are very important. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, then, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I want you to notice all those two words. I pointed them out twice. You are, you are. Jesus always starts with a declaration of who we are in Christ, not where we will become. He starts first with position, who we are in Christ. And from there, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus was not, by the way, speaking this message to perfect people. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. He was speaking to thousands who had gathered. And he said, you are the salt of the world. And there were some people that day, just like this day, going, yeah, I'm salt, not my Uncle Joe. He's a jerk. There are people that say, you are the light of the world. No, no, no. I'm a pretty good person. They're a terrible person. You don't know. Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus makes this declaration. Jesus starts not because he's naive or ignorant. He's the God who knows all things. But Jesus starts from a place of position of who we are and who we can be in Christ. Your salt and your light. This is vastly different from the voice of the enemy who always tempts us to lose sight of who we are in Christ To live our lives working for rather than working from who we are in Jesus. To exhaust ourselves trying to earn the very things that Jesus has already given us. This is the tactic of the enemy. 
Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy left us alone in tough times? Wouldn't it be nice if he left us alone during a pandemic? Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy left us alone during racial inequality? Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy left us alone after the death of a loved one? Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy left us alone after our failures and our divorce? Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy left us alone after a diagnosis? Here's the truth. He isn't nice, and he doesn't. We must have, Dean Sherman said, we must have a revelation of the enemy. Just as we need a divine revelation of God's goodness and mercy and love, so we must also have a revelation of Satan's evil and destructive power. Perhaps Satan's greatest advantage over the children of God is his consistency as opposed to our inconsistency. The attack of the, en- the, attack of the enemy it wages is primarily on our minds, our hearts, and our mouths. Richard Lovelace says this, that although part of the church pays lip surface to the reality of sin, yeah, yeah, I've heard that, worldliness, sure, even demonic agents. Yeah, yeah, I get demons are real, blah, blah, blah. He says this. It seems to me that much of the church's warfare today is fought by blindfolded soldiers who cannot see the forces raged against them, who are buffeted by invisible opponents and respond by striking one another. That does not excuse anybody's behavior, whether individual, church, or systemic. But it is to say, as followers of Christ, we don't excuse behavior, we repent of our behavior. We don't let each other off the hook, but we also acknowledge that we do not merely live in a world of flesh and blood, that there are powers and principalities and rulers and darkness, that they are real, they are active, and they are effective. All of these things, again, can drive how we see the world, how we hear one another, how we respond to one another, or how we don't respond to the brokenness in our own lives, our own church, our own city, our own nation, and our own world. I would like to share a pastoral concern, and I pray you hear it in love, but also with the sphere of spiritual authority that God has entrusted to me that I pray that I'm stewarding well. I say this not as a matter of shame, because there's plenty of awesome things to be learned from, plenty of wisdom to be gained in articles and books and videos on social media. But since March, in the hundred plus emails that I have received from followers of Christ, those who attend Life Center and those who do not, on deeply held issues ranging from the pandemic to race to sexuality to other things that they care deeply about, not a single email. I've been sent hundreds of articles and about 25 to 30 book recommendations, and I would say countless videos on social media. And all of that is good. But I do want to state this with clarity. I have not had, I'm not talking about words of encouragement and interaction. Out of all the followers of Christ sending everything, I have not received a single one that said, I was reading my Bible today. And the Lord convicted me of... I was in prayer today for somebody who I see the world very differently than, and the Lord convicted me of. One of the greatest lies the enemy perpetrates in the West is that the only place spiritual formation happens is within a church. That is a lie. Every time you open Instagram, every time you open Facebook, every time you open TikTok, every time you open any form of social media, any time you consume media, we are consistently being formed into the image of something. Spiritual formation happens everywhere. It happens in every college, in every university, in every elementary school, in every high school. It happens everywhere. And I am not trying to start a culture war. No, 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 a thousand times no. Because when you have sides, all you have is brokenness. What I'm trying to say is, Lord, would we be humble enough to recognize that the collective wisdom of our consciousness is not still enough It doesn't reach enough to know the God who knows all things. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are your ways from my ways. May we be humble because God draws near to the humble, but he opposes the proud. 
And I am concerned. I used to just chalk it up to like, of course, people are reading their Bible. Like, don't worry about it. No longer, because if 2020 has revealed anything, it has revealed the deficit of our discipleship. It has revealed we can disagree on what the Bible says around sexuality. We can disagree about the, what the Bible says around eschatology. We can have conversation and debate around all of these things. And some people can draw an inference and pull out this world. And again, church, we can sometimes be having these robust conversations and we should have debates and dialogues and disagreements and wrestle through different things. These are so very, very vital and important. It is not, unity is not uniformity. We can see things and work together. But if there's one thing Jesus was abundantly clear on and there's one thing the church in the West is failing at, getting an F failure, it is we do not know how to work through offense, conflict together. Jesus was very clear what it looks like to engage this one with another. So again, we should, we must discuss, debate, deliberate, even in love, disagree about what the Bible says. And let me also say this, Life Center is not the only church in the city, and we are not against any other church in the city. Why do I say that? Because if anyone chooses to leave Life Center and go to another church, guess what? They're still a part of the body of Christ. In him we celebrate. There is no room for competition. Jesus needs every church in the city to love the city, to reach the city, and to be the church that he's called us to be. We're not a cult. We don't control. We allow this to engage. And this is tough stuff sometimes. Show of hands online. You can little hands up in the chat. Has anybody here ever been in a conversation with anybody, and you knew what you were about to say, and you knew you shouldn't say it. And the more they talked, the more it came. And you knew, when I say this, and it just, yeah, okay, let me just, let me just do this. So after we cancel everyone, What's the end goal? What's the plan after that? What's the plan after we can't speak? We can't do What's the end game? What's the end goal? No, as followers of Christ, may we have humility to even when we say things that we shouldn't say. May those of you who look like me, if we say things and our black brothers and sisters say that was racist, may we not be just so concerned about how that makes us feel, but may we be humble enough to say, teach me then or help me understand or how can I be more like Jesus? How did that hurt? How can I understand what that is? I genuinely, genuinely believe with all of my heart that this is a picture of what is happening in the culture today, that women are screaming at men going, can't you see? And men are sitting over here going, what's the problem? That white is sitting over here saying, all lives matter. And those who are black are saying, no, black lives matter. We must have the humility at some point to do this. But doing this is dangerous. Doing this is hard work but it is the work of the body of Christ because this is what Jesus said. A church that does this and no church in the world will be perfect at this, but a church that commits itself to this work. Jesus said the greatest evangelistic tool the church has is how we love one another through disagreements. The world will know that you are followers of me by the way in which you love one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to get to it because Jesus actually says, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about you loving people who think like you, agree with you, see the world you do. Even everyone does that. I'm talking about how do you love people who are your enemy? How do you love people who vote for someone with the initial, the first initial of T? How do you love them? In Canada, that may have been Trudeau. If you're United States, that may have been someone else's name. How do you love someone who the very things that they believe make your blood boil? How do we as followers of Christ, Jesus said, how we do this, and let's be honest, none of us are going to do this perfectly. 
And none of us, none of us in our humanity are going to do this perfectly. Dean Sherman said this. So I want you to see if you can recognize, you know, the enemy can't rob your salvation in Christ, but he can sure mess up our next steps. Man, I am complicit in what I'm about to read. It often happens when we gather with friends. It starts with someone making an innocent comment about someone not present. The comments become observations. The observations turn into concerns. The concerns become criticisms, and criticisms become accusations. Oh, we may disguise the ugly progression. Our harsh words can be couched in words of love, yet our mouths can tear down what God is trying to build among us. Lord, I repent. My only response is repentance. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have the power, divine power, to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, not to obey others, to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience. When your obedience, it says, is complete, not perfect, when it's complete, when it's full, when your submission, my submission, our submission as a church is wholehearted, when we are really ready to do what Jesus said, that we've got to die to ourselves. Strongholds in 2 Corinthians refer to the pattern of thinking about God, ourselves, and others, where we never turn back to face one another and we only then condemn one another. And studying the West, there are six drivers that I'm going to go really quickly through because time has elapsed. There are six demonic drivers, if you look at the West, that are infecting us as a people. There are strongholds. One is trying to be perfect. If a stronghold of perfection gets a hold of your heart, it will grind your heart and it will make you callous so that you can never admit fault. You will never admit where you're wrong because you have to do everything perfect. The other one is pleasing everyone. Or there may be certain people in your life who their, their, their words carry more weight about you than what God says about you. These are strongholds. They are real in our hearts and lives. Another one is be strong all the time. Be strong all the time. Did you see it surface during the pandemic? Did you see it on social media? Did you see the shame? If you don't come out of the pandemic better, hey, you have all the time in the world now. There's no excuse for you. Even in North America, through a pandemic, we must perform. That's demonic. Here's what I would say to you. In a pandemic, just get through it. Get through it the best way you can, as humbly as you can. I mean, this is hard on everyone. Another one is you're never enough. You're never enough. It doesn't matter what you do. You feel in your heart. It's just never enough. It's always your fault. It's always your fault. It's always your fault. And the last one is that progress beats presence. That all that matters is progress, not God's presence and not the presence of others. All that matters is we get there. It doesn't matter how we get there. Proverbs 1 verses 29 to 31 says, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill of their own devices. I don't think the proverb writer here was talking about electronic devices, but I think we could read into it now. We'll add it there. Even though you shouldn't add to God's word, that's not good. Satan's lie is this, that your identity comes from what you have done. Be perfect. Please everyone. Hurry up. Be strong. Try harder. Progress beats presence. It's all about progress. No, God's truth is your identity comes from what Jesus did for you. And let me, let me really, really end here. Never mistake or misunderstand Practice with position. The moment my four children were born, 
They're our kids. It doesn't matter what they do. They're always going to be our kids because it's their position. If I brought the four of them up here, they would readily admit they have some work to do in some areas. I would readily admit as a parent, I've got some work to do in some areas. Those are practices, not position. There are some of you who base your following. So here's what's, here's what's true. You may have terrible spiritual practices. That's just the truth. Watching online or here. You may never read your Bible. You never pray. You, you, you never, you're not generous. You, 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 you don't turn the other cheek. You may have terrible spiritual practices. That's true. But if you've given your life to Christ, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The most spiritually immature follower of Jesus has the authority and the position in Christ to speak to demonic things, to speak to strongholds. If we turned off all the light in this place, it is the smallest flicker of light that will dispel the densest darkness. It is not just the volume of it. It is the mere presence of it. But the enemy always, always tries to get our, pra- our eyes. Now listen, we need to develop our practices. We, yes, 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 a thousand times yes. But these things don't make you a better Christian. They make you more like Jesus, which in turn affects the world in a glorious way. Don't allow your spiritual enemy to confuse the difference between position and practice. In the next three weeks, we're going to talk about what, what do we do? Three or four weeks, I can't remember. What do we do? What do we do when we're here? What do we do when we're offended? What does it look like for there to be forgiveness, reconciliation, and yes, restitution and justice? What does it look like? And what did Jesus teach about these things? I invite you to stand together as we just sing a song to open our hearts. Thank you for allowing us to have a family chat. I know it's not like a normal Sunday, but I don't think this is a normal time. And so uh, where Jesus was faithful today, to God be the glory, and where I missed it today, Thanks for the truth if there's feedback, but also just thanks also for your grace to allow me to grow to be more like Jesus.